Good morning, and uh, this is uh, really exciting for me to be uh, giving a talk between Deborah Hyde and James Randi uh, in a session about paranormal investigation, since I'm not a paranormal investigator. And uh, so I'll just uh, talk about what's in my blog and in my book, and uh, it's called Relativer Quantenquark, which translates roughly to relative quantum nonsense. And um, if you're expecting some kind of a scientific talk from me with uh, theory and uh, conclusions at the end, I've kind of twisted things around and, and put the hard stuff in the middle and uh, let us all have some fun in the end. And because I think this is a topic where you can have some fun and positive or negative uh, skepticism notwithstanding, uh, it's perfectly legitimate to have some fun fun with that because some things uh, you don't have to ridicule, they are just ridiculous all by themselves. So uh, yeah, what is, what is quantum nonsense? And kind of to me, kind of the epitome of quantum nonsense is uh, this book here by uh, this person, Deepak Chopra. Uh, now Deepak Chopra has written 75 books and uh, 21 of them were New York Times bestsellers, but this was kind of a special one. Uh, first of all, it sold about 800,000 copies for him. This was the one that got him the Ig Nobel Prize, and he has pieces of wisdom in there like, physicists now accept interconnectedness as a ruling principle, so what if quantum reality was just as present in our own thoughts, emotions, and desires? And finally, so the quantum mechanical body as a formation of intelligence has a plausible place in non-local reality. Now, if you don't understand this last statement, that's a sign that you're intelligent. Because th th there is a study that actually says that people who find, uh, find, make, uh, make a sense of, of uh, Deepak Chopra's quotes are less intelligent than others. <laughs> so, uh, yes, um, the, probably if, if you want to know what quantum healing actually is, the best way uh, for me to explain quantum healing to you is to, to heal somebody. So, uh, uh, I need a volunteer who needs to be healed. Oh, hello, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Come up to the stage, please. Now, the, the, the first thing that you might ask yourself, is, is he actually able to do this? I mean, uh, and, and trust me, I'm a physicist, uh, so I, I know a heck of a lot more about quantum physics than most of the people practicing quantum healing. Uh, second, you might ask yourself, is he allowed to do this? Because, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm not a physician. I don't have a doctor's approbation, uh, and I don't even have the, the, what we have in Germany, the alternative practitioner's exam. Uh, but uh, at least in Germany, I am actually allowed to do this because the German Supreme Court has ruled, I mean, quantum healers are spiritual healers, and the German Supreme Court has ruled that spiritual healers do not need an alternative healer's uh, certificate for the very simple reason that nobody in his right mind would expect, actually expect medical attention from a spiritual healer. <laughs> So the German Supreme Court has ruled that I am allowed to heal you because the Supreme Court knows that you know that I cannot heal you in the first place. <laughs> so, uh, okay, now, I've, I've, uh, first of all, uh, rest assured, you don't have to tell me want, what you want to be healed of, and you don't, nobody has to know, because the exchange of information is completely by quantum entanglement. Um, <laughs> So what I, what I need you to do is to imagine what it would be like if you were healed. Uh, can you do that for me? I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying. Okay, good. So um, what I'm gonna do now is first of all, I am going to imagine that you are healed. And uh, the second thing is, I'm going to touch two points of your body, nothing, nothing too embarrassing, just it's random two points, but it has to be two points for the quantum entanglement to work. So, uh, yeah, now uh, imagine that uh, what it would be like if you, are, uh, if you were healed. Yeah, uh, thank you, I hope you're feeling better already, and uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if you need a second session, I'm... If you need a second session, of course, I'm going to have to charge you for that, the first one is free. So, uh, that is quantum physics for you. And uh, quantum physics isn't the only uh, theory that's affected by this. I, uh, I looked into, into uh, the theory of relativity and uh, there uh, I found, uh, in, it, it took me about five minutes to find three books that cite the theory of relativity to explain supernatural causes. So, um, yeah. 
we, of course, if, if we want to look into this and what about this is Wu and why it is Wu, uh, I cannot avoid uh, telling you some of the real physics in a nutshell. And to do this, I'm going to skip over the theory of relativity and go straight to quantum mechanics for the very simple reason that I only have five minutes about, uh, for that. And I can use five minutes to either explain the theory of relativity or quantum mechanics to you, but not both. That's a bit, a bit too much. So, uh, first of all, you, you, you all, you've all seen the this, this symbol. The one on the upper left is uh, the March for Science, the International Atomic Energy Organization. There's one from a school book. So, this is an atom, right? Well, this is what physics imagined an atom might look like between 1911 and 1927. So uh, this was already outdated by the time the oldest of ones here in the room were born. Uh, if we had want to get a slightly more realistic impression of what an atom might look like if we could see it, it's something like that on the upper left. So there is nucleus in the middle, which is way too big in this picture. Uh, and then the electrons are around this in, in kind of a, a, a washed out cloud. So we cannot say an electron is moving on this trajectory in this orbit. It's just the electrons are just there and they are in this place with this probability and that place with that probability. And this whole thing is called a quantum state. So in this quantum state, nothing is actually moving. This all, there are just probabilities that something is in this or that place. And uh, there are some interesting aspects about quantum states. Now, first of all, uh, a quantum state, if we want to measure where the electron actually is, we, we have to scatter something off the electron. We need an interaction. So we could take a, a photon, a light particle, scatter that off an electron, and then with that photon getting into the detector, we would be able to find out where the electron was before we scattered something off it. So we cannot measure anything in quantum physics in a quantum state without changing the quantum state, and that's called the observer effect, for historical reasons, actually, because it has nothing whatsoever to do with the observer. It's, it's simply uh, the result of us needing an interaction to be able to measure something. Um, second, uh, the quantum state can extend through space, and if we're not looking at electrons, if we're looking at, at photons, if we have two photons produced in the same process, they can still be entangled by the time they, they, uh, they are hundreds of kilometers apart. They can still be quantum, as, as far as quantum states go, the same object. And we can do a manipulation on one of them and measure the effect on the other, although that's 100 kilometers away. And that's called entanglement. And quantum states can also comprise mutually exclusive, normally mutually exclusive states of the same particle. So if we, ha if we have a particle that's unstable, that will decay after a time, as long as it's in the quantum state, it can be half, uh, half decayed and half non-decayed. The moment we measure, the co uh, we're, we, we, we see it as a classical particle and we find, okay, now it's decayed or now it's non-decayed. But as long as it's in the undisturbed quantum state, it can be a little bit of both and that's called a superposition. So we have all these strange effects, but the one thing to keep in mind that all of these strange effects and the, basically the quantum state itself, uh, that, that all disappears the moment that the quantum state gets in touch with the outside world. The moment there is an interaction with the outside world, uh, something sets in that's called decoherence, and this quantum state uh, disappears and we get the, the actual electron or the actual proton or the actual photon that acts like a normal particle. And uh, actually what, what I've mentioned as the observer effect at the very top is nothing else than decomposition, which is a, 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 than decoherence, which is at, at the bottom. So that's basically two uh, names for the same thing. Contact with the outside world changes the quantum state. So what we have is, is kind of, and this, this was puzzling for physicists for, for many, many years, uh, we have these kind of two worlds. We have the quantum state on the one hand, uh, that refers to single particles that are isolated from the outside world where all these strange effects appear. And on the other side, we have the classical world of classical particles or big objects like that one there. And there are no quantum effects there. And uh, as you're going from the one on the left to the one on the right, people thought for a very long time that there would something, they, they, I mean, they were looking for explanations for this. And, coming up with the idea that the quantum state suddenly collapses into a particle and things like this. And that was, uh, gave, uh, gave way to all kinds of speculation and uh, the speculation has lived on through 
philosophy and mysticism, and it's, it's still around today. And uh, the fact is that physics has actually moved on, and we know nowadays that this is not two totally separate worlds, but that there is a transition zone in between them. And uh, this, we've known about this transi tra transition zone theoretically for about 40 years. We can experiment with that for about 20 years, and it's still not very well known. So if we go to larger sets of particles, like larger molecules, we can still find some quantum effects, although in principle they behave like classical particles. If we go to an incomplete form of isolation from the outside world, you have magnetic fields working on the quantum state, you'll see some classical and some quantum effects mixing, or in, in living cells, uh, in the molecules of living cells, particles can be half isolated from the outside world, which is basically uh, quantum biology, which uh, Jim Al-Khalili gave an excellent talk about at the last uh, European Skeptics Conference in London. So this is all relatively, fa fairly, uh, relatively well understood now, and not quite as mysterious as it always seemed. But the one thing to keep in mind that everything that happens in our daily lives happens on the very right of this picture. Everything that happens in our daily lives is basically classical physics. And that gets us to some simple rules of how to avoid being quantum fooled and how to avoid being told quantum woo without really say, uh, knowing what to say about this. The first thing uh, to know about quantum nonsense and to be able to not be fooled by quantum nonsense is to understand how it works. And there is actually a pattern that is recurring every time you, or almost every time you encounter quantum nonsense for how it is created. First of all, if you want to make your own quantum nonsense, you start out with a well-established and, and hard, somewhat hard to understand statement from modern physics like something that everybody's heard, E equals MC square. Everybody has heard it. Not everybody understands it. Very few people know where it actually comes from. But uh, yeah, it's there, and people generally accept it. Uh, and physicists will say, OK, this is, this is fine. This is OK. This is acceptable. And what you do next is you start to take the scientific terms out of there, in this case, mass and equivalent, and replace them with kind of their everyday meaning of the same word. So you end up with something like, therefore, matter is simply energy. And at this point, a physicist, a well-meaning physicist, is going to say, well, I know what you're trying to say, but you really shouldn't say it that way. But if you have an audience that's uh, accepted this still as physics, then you can just move on and freely associate any kind of arbitrary bullshit that you want and go, move on to that is the energy of our minds. And this is actually an example that I found in exactly this way in a book on hypnosis. So the question is, why do people believe that? Why do we accept that? And the reason, of course, is that relativity and quantum mechanics are well-accepted concepts, although they are contrary to our intuition and everyday experience. And therefore, it's relatively easy to conclude that yeah, I mean, we have to accept ideas that are contrary to our intu intuition and experience uh, because physics does it all the time. Well, the point is that they are contrary to our everyday experience because they are about things that are not part of our everyday experience. And if we're talking about, about our body and our health that are part of our everyday experience, uh, the same things don't necessarily apply. So what would have to be the case for quantum physics and, and relativity to be relevant to the way we lead our lives and to, to the way we treat our bodies? Well, quantum physics might be relevant for your body if your body consists only of a few atoms or if your body temperature is below minus 270 degrees Celsius. Uh, if that's the case, I'd be very surprised if you were sitting here. If that's not the case, then the result of quantum physics is going to be perfectly identical to the results of classical physics or chemistry. Um, what about the theory of relativity? Now, the theory of relativity might be relevant to your body if you regularly move faster than about a million kilometers per hour, if you are heavier than at least a mid-sized comet, or if your mind works in intervals that or you make decisions in intervals of about nanoseconds or so. If that is not the case, then the result of the theory of relativity is going to be perfectly identical to classical physics. 
So these are some kind of rules of thumb to decide uh, whether, uh, of course, I mean, if we have instruments that make measurements at that rate, yes, fine. Like GPS, for example, works by measuring very short time spans, then you have to take the theory of relativity into account. That's the thing. So, uh, but that's kind of a rule of thumb of, of where, what you have to look at. But there are also some red flags to look out for that are usually, when they come up in a, in a conversation or in a text, that are usually followed by nonsense. And the first one is uh, everything is connected. And we saw that in Deepak Chopra, the very first Deepak Chopra quote I had is every interconnectedness is a ruling principle. So this is a typical example of uh, something in quantum physics that uh, this is definitely not something that you can reasonably derive from, from, from quantum physics, not any more than anything is connected, but everything is connected by, by gravity and classical physics, uh, but still it's, it's there. And it's, it's, it's a typical sign that whatever comes after that is probably nonsense. Uh, the next thing is the observer determines the outcome, which is just a misunderstanding of the observer effect that I mentioned. Uh, the, obs the observation causes something to change, but uh, the observer does not determine what uh, is uh, going to be the outcome. And we, we're going to have an example of that in just a moment. Uh, then there is this, everything consists of waves or fields or energy, and to the extreme form of that matter doesn't exist. And unfortunately, the former director of the institute where I got my PhD uh, regularly went on the medium, media with uh, statements like this, which was basically his personal interpretation of physics and, uh, uh, and his first personal philosophical views, but because we, he was the director of the Max Planck Institute for Physics, he was quoted as an authority. And Yeah, and finally, un unfortunately, uh, most mentions of, of Schrodinger's cat uh, in, in uh, any kind of non-physics, and even in most physics uh, texts, uh, is an indication that what comes after that is, is nonsense, because actually it's, it's been around for 70 years, and there is really nothing reasonable to say in physics that you might want to talk about Schrodinger's cat about. And this is going to be following us for the next couple of examples, too. Now, if we want to get people to not be fooled by quantum nonsense. Uh, the, the reasonable approach for skeptics and the typical approach for skeptics would be to, know, to say, okay, now we have to educate people more about science and we have to, physicists have to talk more about, about what they're doing and there should be more science communication. And uh, the thing is, I, originally I submitted this talk for the, for the uh, science, pseudoscience and the media session because one of my points is that uh, science communication, the way it's done nowadays, isn't always helpful. And I've left one of my examples in there, which uh, again involves Schrodinger's cat. And I saw this first in a headline in a German newspaper. It's also in the, in the Washington Post, so I don't have to translate it. I can just use the English one. Schrodinger's cat just got even weirder and even more confusing. This is a headline from last year. And, uh, yeah, I was wondering what, what's going on here, what is, again, it's been around, Schrodinger's cat has been around for 70 years and it hasn't become any more, doesn't tell us any more reasonable things than it did at the time. So what possibly could there be in new discoveries regarding Schrodinger's cat? So, well, maybe the journalist at the Washington Post, general interest newspaper, got things wrong and let's look at a science magazine. Maybe we, that's going to be more telling. In Science News, the, the same headline on the same day said, Schrodinger's cat now dead and alive in two boxes at once. Okay, now these are science journalists. They should know what they're talking about and they should get this from a scientific publication. So what was actually coming out of the science, scientific world? What did scientists actually say that they could have misunderstood that way? Well, look at the original press release from Yale University because that's where it comes from. And the original press release said, doubling down on Schrödinger's cat. Yale physicists have given Schrödinger's famous cat a second box to play in. Now, wait a minute. So it's not the journalists who came up with this weird stuff. It's, it's the Yale press office, right? I mean, it couldn't possibly have been the scientists themselves. All right, let's look at the original science publication in a science journal. And actually, the journal that they published it in is, uh, well, pretty much one of the, the most 
down to earth and serious ones that you could probably, probably, uh, possibly look at, at least one of the most reputa reputable ones, it's in Science. And uh, the original article in Science, published May uh, uh, 2016, had the headline, A Schrodinger Cat Living in Two Boxes. So I looked at the article, and I looked, what did they do with a Schrodinger cat in two boxes? What did they do in the first place? Now, what they did was they had two little resonators, cavities about the size of a film box, if you still remember what those look like. And uh, they had these two film boxes side by side, and uh, they had a microwave signal, about 100 photons each, so a very, very, very weak microwave signal moving up and down in these two resonators. And they created entanglement between those two microwave signals, which in a way is an interesting physics result. It's certainly an interesting and hard to do experiment. The question that keeps bothering me is, where is the cat? <laughs> and the answer, of course, is there is no cat. This whole experiment has nothing whatsoever to do with Schrodinger's cat. I mean, even, it doesn't even address the question that Schrödinger, Schrödinger was talking about in Schrödinger's cat. It's, it has nothing whatsoever to do with it. The only possible connection that you can create with Schrödinger's cat is that at some point, physicists have started talking about every, every quantum state that involves more than two particles as a cat state. But, which, which is stupid in itself, but I mean, as long as you're talking among physicists, the others are going to know what you're talking about. The moment you put this on the headline of a publication and it ends up in the headline of a regular general interest newspaper, people are just not going to understand what you're talking about. And you're simply going to be promoting quantum woo. And uh, if you're wondering why I'm, I keep picking on Schrodinger's cat, well, uh, let's look at some of the quantum woo out there. And uh, let's, let's look at a German blog that's called Detox Quantum. And uh, I probably don't have to tell you what the lady running this blog normally sells. And uh, she's on her blog, she's written an article, I think that was uh, for the beginning of 2017, on Schrödinger's cat. And she writes the following. Through his experiences and expectations linked to them, the observer himself controls the result. And I've mentioned this as a typical red flag. His emotions determine the vibration of his thinking, and his thinking manifests matter. In this case, Mr. Schrödinger's cat. If Mr. Schrödinger, when opening the box, is in panic about finding his cat dead, that will happen. If he is happily looking forward to a cuddling experience with his cat, that is what will happen. Quantum mechanics is really cool. Now, there is, there is one sentence in this, and there's actually one sentence in this entire article that is perfectly reasonable and uh, perfectly fine, and that is quantum mechanics is really cool. Uh, unfortunately, uh, whoever has written this has absolutely understood absolutely nothing about quantum physics. Uh, and I mean, first of all, and I've mentioned this decoherence, something that's connected with the outside world cannot possibly be in a quantum state. Uh, so, uh, no cat can ever be in a quantum state, at least not a living one. Uh, and um, so, but suppose uh, Schrödinger in this, this example is not looking at a cat, He's actually, he was actually looking at a quantum state. Still, his expectations would not determine the outcome, because when you measure a quantum state within the probabilities defined by the quantum state, the result that you get is completely random, and there is no way you can influence them. That's exactly what quantum physics says. So this is the exact opposite of what she's saying, and what she's saying is kind of this, this secret uh, thing of wish the world as you want it, and it's going to happen, and that is the exact opposite of what quantum physics says. And if you think this is a German problem, well, you can find an article on Conscious Life News with the title Bending Spoons, Bending Reality, and Loving Schrodinger's Cat, and it's going to be the, exactly the same nonsense. Um, but you cannot only uh, have living and dead cats, you can also speculate about burying a cat, and burying a cat is stupid, as was the German uh, parapsychologist Walter von Lukadu says in an interview in the prestigious German newspaper Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. And the paper asked him, uh, the, the, the whole thing was about, they asked him what the German football coach could do to make his players play better. 
and uh, he said he should create an entanglement between his players. And again, an entanglement can only exist in a quantum state, and a quantum state can only exist if something is completely isolated from the outside world. And I've, I mean, I've heard about a vacuum in the head of a football player, but I have never heard of a football player surrounded by a vacuum. So no football players cannot be in a quantum state, uh, and so they cannot be entangled. This is, from a physics point of view, perfect nonsense. And we're going to another country, uh, trying to look a little bit around Europe. So let's go to Italy and to a book by Giovanni Vota, Spiritual Quantum Coaching. And he has an example in there about, uh, about uh, meditating Maharishis, uh, yogic flyers, and their effect on supposedly reducing uh, violent crime in Washington in an experiment. In, uh, 1993, and uh, he explains this by what else? By quantum entanglement. So the, the, the uh, flying yogis are entangled with the criminals, and uh, as they're meditating, the criminals will become less violent. Uh, I don't have to explain anything more about that. But this is really interesting. This is from Switzerland, and this is uh, a consulting firm, a management consulting firm. I'm a, I'm a management consultant nowadays, so this is pretty close to to home for me, uh, and they say, quantum physics today assumes that the space in each atom, each atom is filled with countless elementary particles. They can connect, entanglement, and exchange information. With quantum physical technology, it is now possible to scan the information carriers of the zero-point field, re retrieving information quality, and inform them, adjusting information quality. The system lauded by experts allows the use of quantum physics based on white noise. So, and this is, in, this is really interesting for me. Now, where as, a, as a, a management consultant, I normally have to spend some days to do a market analysis. They just need a couple of minutes to read the results from the white noise. And when they've come to a conclusion, they'll just derive the information that they want to put into the company and put that back into the white noise. And, and they're done, and they can write a bill. And if you're wondering what kind of companies will pay those bills, well, uh, they have it on their web page. Uh, there's uh, one of the largest European insurance companies, two, uh, two uh, not so small engineering firms, a Swiss private bank, and one of the largest food companies of the world. And this is not just in Switzerland, and this is not just one company. In the German-speaking areas alone, I have found, uh, I mean, these are, these are these antennas that they use to read the information out of the white noise. Uh, so, and there, there are two, uh, two companies producing these devices, and there are actually dozens of consulting firms offering this kind of service. And there's, uh, I'm, I said close to home, there is one actually a five-minute walk from where I live. Uh, yeah, and uh, now we're, we're getting to, if, if you find that this is not absurd enough, uh, let us get to tachyons. Um, and uh, we're going to Belgium, and uh, in, in Antwerp and in Ghent, you can learn how to do tachyon massages. And they say about this, a tachyon massage is done with the unique tachyon bars. I mean, these are the tachyon bars that this massage is made with. These massage bars and the tachyonized oils you use are meant to provide a particularly efficient and relaxing massage. A tachyon is a subatomic particle that moves faster than light. Well, that, of course, is uh, contrary to the theory of relativity. So uh, discovering a particle that moves faster than the speed of light is uh, actually would have been a really, really interesting result in physics, and experimental physicists have been looking for that for about a century. And unfortunately, that, as I said, that would be really interesting. Unfortunately, they haven't found anything in more than a century. Um, so physicists are completely, have, for, for a century, physicists have been unable to actually find tachyons, but in Antwerp, you can get a massage with them. <laughs> and if after that massage, you feel really relaxed and you come home and you feel in the mood for something more, don't worry, you can get the tachyon products for that too. So how about uh, Passion Dew Tachyon Lubricant, also with particles moving faster than the speed of light uh, for the ultimate quickie. Uh, so if, you're, if, if, that's, if for some reason you, you find you, you cannot manage uh, 
How about the tachyon sex tonic for men? And finally, we're getting to my absolute favorite product. Don't worry, I don't have it at home, but I, I find it absolutely fascinating. The tachyon glass plug, which you can insert into your root chakra. And frankly, at this point, there is nothing left I have to say. Thank you.